If your project has undergone many changes due to the contributions of multiple developers, you may not be familiar with how the automated tests were written. Do you still have enough trust in your test suite to rely on the fact that a green CI build means that everything is okay? Many tools provide metrics about your code and tests. In this talk, Antonello will explore ways to evaluate the effectiveness of your test suite, how to improve it, and the benefits of having a comprehensive set of automated tests. Antonello DiPolito, a software engineer and agile practitioner, will present the topic. Let's get on with it. Yeah. Go, go, go. Hello. Hello, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so, how can I trust my test suite? I don't know uh, about you, but I ask this question to myself a lot of times in my career. Um, the, the, the scenario is, let's say that you just started in a beautiful new project that you don't know, but uh, you start looking at the test suite, for example, to check, okay, uh, can I trust it? Is it uh, comprehensive? Is it understandable? Uh, and it looks like it. So that's uh, the, the idea is that you start shipping uh, uh, the first features um, and you run your test suite, which is green, uh, you're happy, but then you understand that it becomes a little bit complicated to refactor all the stuff. Uh, even adding new features is not that easy because you start shipping bugs uh, together with them. You, you maybe start shipping uh, um, regressions even, uh, so that becomes from ODA to a monster. And then you start losing trust in your test suite, which is the, um, well, the thing that you should never do. So uh, the idea is that you can regain trust in your test suite, even if you don't know it, if you, if you didn't write it. And uh, there are tools, there are metrics, there are techniques that you can use. Uh, so I'm gonna try to explore, that, what, explore them with you. Um, I'm Antonello, I'm Italian, as you can probably tell from my accent, I don't know, but uh, when I performed the other talk, they told me that I look like an Italian because I move my hands a lot, but uh, <laughs> probably that's, uh, that's very true. And um, I moved to the Netherlands five years ago, uh, and I work for a company called Molly, uh, which is a payment processor. We operate also in, uh, in Poland, so maybe uh, you even uh, saw Molly uh, logo somewhere, or uh, in your bank statement, or whatever. So we, we process payments, pretty much. Um, and it means that we are in a critical and very regulated industry, and uh, I personally want and need to trust my test suite if I want to ship constantly uh, and um, in fast iterations. But uh, this is going to be a journey, mostly an investigation of all the tools, of all the metrics that are out there. Uh, so since, since it's an investigation, uh, I think I want to uh, do it myself, but I asked my dear friend, uh, Chef Cold Holmes, uh, which is obviously an investigator, um, uh, but investigator of cold. So that's, uh, that's the idea. And share code obviously starts from the very basic thing that you can do to assess uh, a test suite and is running the, code, the, the test coverage or code coverage, I don't know, however you want to call it, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, test coverage is the measure, uh, the degree of which the source code of our program or our system is executed uh, when a particular test suite runs. And the word executed here, um, it doesn't work, yes, executed here is very important. It's not uh, what we are testing, but what is executed of our production code that is important here, because let's see why. Uh, let's say that we need to model um, a nuclear reactor in our application, which is, again, also critical, because, well, nuclear reactor. And uh, we model uh, this, we, we, this, we have this class that models a nuclear reactor with this method. Uh, it's a simple method, it's called it's dangerous and returns true if the temperature that we pass as an uh, argument is uh, greater or equal than 1000 degrees. Um, otherwise it returns false. And uh, the test is also very simple, I always forget to run this animation. The, the test is also very simple. We instantiate our reactor, uh, our class, and then we uh, test for 500 and we say that yes, it falls, so they should return false, and then we test for 2000 and then in that case it should return true. We are happy, uh, the, um, the test suite, this, this very small test suite, 
is a, uh, has a 100% good coverage, which is well, great. Then one day, uh, we, I don't know, we, we came back to the office after drinking too much at lunchtime. I don't know if you drink at lunchtime. When I was in Italy, I used to drink wine during lunchtime, so that, this could have happened, uh, especially on Fridays. And uh, I changed this line. Or maybe a junior engineer, that's more likely. A junior engineer uh, doesn't really know how the code should work and says, okay, but to me, uh, I think this line doesn't make sense. Let me change it from uh, greater or equal than to just greater than. Uh, there's tests, so I'm fine. Uh, the test stays the same, I don't need to change it. And it's green, and it's still 100% good coverage, right? So um, this is my pipeline that brings my uh, software to production after every change. Uh, it says, yeah, it's green, I checked everything. Um, good coverage is still 100%, tests are running. So I'll, I'll uh, deploy to production. At some point, the temperature rises uh, to 1000, and this is what happens. Um, so we clearly have a bug. Something happened there. So let's see what, what happened and what we can do. Uh, let's start from, uh, from, one, uh, from one quote uh, that I think it basically represents my thoughts on test coverage, which is not it, it, it useless, completely useless, but it's just there to highlight what's not covered. It doesn't tell us anything to the uh, to the production code that we covered already with tests. It doesn't give us any insight on the quality of our tests because 100% but still we have a bug. Okay, then obviously shared code is, is, uh, is not satisfied. Yeah. It uh, um, keeps investigating, keeps uh, going on and then uh, uh, realizes that in a PHP unit, for example, uh, there are a couple of metrics that the, the PHP unit dashboard already provides us. I don't know if you saw the, you never saw the PHP unit dashboard that is produced when you run tests. Uh, besides telling you the coverage and everything, it also gives you a few metrics, uh, interesting metrics, and two of them are the psychomatic complexity and the CRAP index, or CRAP, if you want to be a bit more polite, uh, index. Um, it's actually an, an acronym, so uh, that's why um, I should pronounce it, pronounce it like that. Um, Psychomatic complexity is the measure of the, the, the number of linearly independent uh, branches or paths that we have in our, in our code that we want to test. And uh, yeah, it's basically, the, it increases with the number of if-else or nested if-else, uh, while loops or uh, uh, switch or match cases or whatever you want to call it. So all the control flows uh, uh, combined together will increase a lot the, the, the psychomatic complexity uh, of our code. And a high psychomatic complexity means that the code is hard to understand because, well, you need to follow with your brain uh, uh, all the flows and all the branches and take into consideration all the branches uh, that the code can have. Uh, and it means that it's also hard to test properly. Because, well, we would need to, uh, if we want to write a unit test, um, or in general a test, on that piece of code, it means that we need to um, check all the possible branches, or almost all the possible branches, so it gets complicated in complicated uh, code. And that equals the code is hard to change. And being hard to change uh, is quite a risk, because it can contain bugs, then bugs that are hard to debug and fix or uh, just I want to evolve that feature, I want to evolve that software um, and it's hard to do that so it's expensive uh, so we don't want that. Uh, the CRAP uh, index is, um, it tells us something a, a little more than the, just the psychomatic complexity and it was introduced by a, a fellow Italian, I think, uh, Alberto Savoia and these, uh, th these links are all, uh, these articles are, are all in links so when I share the uh, the slides of the presentation, you'll find all the links of all the articles there. And it looks like a very complicated, um, well, a, a fairly complicated uh, um, a formula, but it's actually telling us that if the coverage tends to 100, then we have that this index is basically just um, goes linearly with, uh, with the complexity. So the more complex, uh, the higher is the index. But if the code coverage is 
tens to one hundred or to zero actually, then uh, this index goes with um, the with the square of the complexity, so much worse. Um, we can calculate the, this here RAT index for all the pieces of code, for all the classes, for example, in our PHP application. Um, and it's going to tell us where the risks of our project are and risks that we need to mitigate by running better tests. Um, if, if we want to plot this information on a, on a diagram, ideally, um, we have complexity and coverage, and we want all our classes, all our units of code, let's put it like that, in the bottom right corner. That is, if the complexity is, uh, uh, we can accept like a slightly lower code coverage if the complexity is low. And uh, if, if the complexity goes uh, to the roof, uh, then uh, uh, we want pretty much 100%, or even we shouldn't even accept certain from certain complexity on. We should refactor our code. But obviously, to refactor our code, we need good tests. Um, share code is not satisfied. It's never satisfied because um, it also knows that no, not all the units of code that we have in, have in our code base are equally important. Some pieces of code are more important, more critical to your business than others. Um, also inspired probably by this tweet by Kent Beck. Uh, it was two years ago, but still very relevant. Um, and it's like having 100% code coverage is like reading all the words in a newspaper. Um, it doesn't really give you the benefit that you think it does, because some words are more important than others. Probably the most efficient strategy is reading the most relevant words or articles in a newspaper uh, for you and not really read every single word in the newspaper. Um, what we can use here to assess what are the, um, to programmatically maybe assess what are the parts of our code that are more critical to our business, for example. Well, uh, besides knowing them, <laughs> uh, is we, we can also use a tool that is or, uh, principle that is called the charm. It's very simple. It was introduced by um, Michael Feathers and uh, it's basically the number of times that we touch a single unit of code. That can be a class, a function, or, or just a file. And um, for example, it can be the number of commits. If you're using a, a Git or any other uh, versioning system, we can rely on it because every commit for, can be considered a change on that piece of code. What Michael Feathers um, tells us in this article is that in application, in, so in systems that are uh, complex enough, uh, we have this kind of situation. So uh, we, we can run a tool that I'll show you later, and we will see that um, this is the, the, the files that we have in our project, and this is the time that they are changed. Besides the numbers um, on, the, on this axis here, the situation is going to be very similar to this one in the sense that a few files, or really a small percentage of files or units of code, let's be generic here, uh, are changed a lot. And they probably contain either, uh, I don't know, a complicated configuration that we keep changing, or maybe they contain business logic that we change to adapt to the market, to adapt our product to the market. So very critical stuff while like 80% if not more uh, of the project is like it's code that is there, it's useful, it's executed but it's not changed a lot so it's maybe more a dormant configuration or I don't know, features that are there, they work, nobody complains nobody touches them um, so in that sense we can identify which part of the code we need to uh, kind of look at uh, with, a, with a higher priority than the rest and if we uh, plot, want to plot again this thing on a, a complexity versus churn uh, kind of diagram, then we can, uh, we can say that we want all our units of code to be under this line. Um, that is, if the churn uh, is a lot, then we want to lower the complexity. Because if we lower the complexity, we can easier uh, we can test easier that unit of code, and we can change it easier because it's more understandable, uh, so it's more changeable, it's more 
uh, evolvable. And uh, vice versa, obviously, if the uh, charm is low, we can allow, uh, we can afford a bit more complexity. Like a piece of code that is super complex, nobody, nobody knows what to do, but it's there, uh, it works, uh, nobody touches it because nobody needs to, yeah, then maybe it's not your first priority to like refactor or write more tests. Um, uh, yeah, as I promised, th this is the tool that you can use. It's called uh, Charm PHP. Uh, it's a very simple tool that basically lists all the files that you have in your uh, repository. And so it's based on files. You should have like one, uh, um, one um, class or function for each file if you want to make it effective. And uh, it's basically telling you the times uh, a piece of code. So uh, this, uh, this file is changed based on the git uh, history and the complexity uh, to for uh, it's it's low complexity so something that we can uh, allow and afford and you can see here that it also calculates a score um it's it's also it's a relatively simple simple formula it goes from 0 to 1 and 1 is uh, uh, is very dangerous it's a, it's a higher risk because it, it means that it's a piece of code that is changed a lot and uh, it's, uh, it's very complex. In this case, uh, this is a Laravel package, I think, this one that I used to um, run. And um, yeah, they did a good job, to be honest, because 0 0.5, not even 0 0.5 is fine. So this is a, an ideal situation. Things uh, change a lot frequently, especially in, in these two files. And this is the kernel. Uh, I don't know why the kernel should change this much, but that's OK. But the complexity is super low, so it's fine. Um, yes, so we talked about code, production code that is more important and that we should pay more attention to, that we should maybe lower the complexity and add a few tests more, uh, but it's still about coverage. So covering some parts of the code more than others, uh, because some are more important than others, but not the quality. We're not still not talking about the quality of the tests. And one of the things that ShareCode over the years, um, let's say, explored and decided to go for is this. It's a bit of a controversial, uh, if you want, uh, kind of a topic. But um, there's a beautiful uh, article that explains uh, way better than I will do right now, uh, because it's super long, uh, from James Shore. But in short, avoiding uh, the mocking frameworks and avoid, uh, avoiding using the mocks, the pre-programmed mocks uh, that we can create with a mocking framework and therefore avoid testing the implementation is going to increase the quality of our tests. Um, let's see how, but first let's try to understand different ter terminology. So I. I was in the other room talking about tests uh, this morning, and I was complaining about the fact that there's no shared definitions for this kind of stuff. And, and also in this case, there's no shared definitions. Uh, there's no formal definition for test double, for mocks. Uh, so I will uh, tell you what, what is my definition, at least. And it's mocks are pre-programmed objects that I create on the fly in a test um, to use as a dependency of the uh, system that under test, so on the, the, of the class that I'm actually testing, um, and are pre-programmed uh, because uh, and created by mocking frameworks, so they're very related. Um, test doubles are like a layer above; it's it's more a, a, a category of objects, and Mox is one of those objects. And one, it, it's a type of test double. Uh, and we'll see there, there is other types of test doubles that do different things, and they work differently in our tests, and we'll see in a bit. Um, so let's look at this, uh, our nuclear reactor. Uh, it's evolved a bit, because now we want to read the temperature. Instead of uh, pest as an argument to our method, we want to read it from a sensor, a temperature sensor. As you can imagine, the temperature sensor uh, in the end is actually a piece of hardware. So it's a, a sensor that is there, uh, and we're going to have a class that uh, reads from it. But if you want to write a unit test for this um, nuclear reactor class, then we don't want to use the piece of hardware, right? It's uh, unreliable, it's slow, 
Um, it's not predictable. We, we just cannot use it. Um, so we, we need to use a test double in this case. Uh, well, the class stays simple. It's basically yeah, two meaningful lines of code. Uh, I'm calling this sensor through these current temperature methods, uh, and it's going to return me an integer, and then uh, I'll make my, my logic here and return true or false. Uh, this temperature sensor here, by the way, is an interface, obviously, because I'm crossing the boundary of the infrastructure. Uh, so I need an interface. And uh, how can I test this? Well, um, two approaches here. One is with mocks, um, with a pre-programmed mock using uh, the mocking framework, framework that uh, a PHP unit uh, provides us. So, my sensor is going to be a mock. I do create mock with the interface. Uh, I, I set some expectation, like that uh, a method called current temperature uh, needs to be called just once. Um, and you can tell already that I'm going in the details of the implementation of this class, like the method name and how many times it's called its implementation detail. Uh, and it will return 2,000 for, my, for the sake of my test case. Uh, then I instantiate the nuclear reactor, passing this sensor, uh, injecting this, this uh, sensor object, and then I will, uh, um, well, verify that returns true. This uh, is without mocks. Um, it's a, this, uh, this sensor here uh, that you see in the first line, it's a different kind of test double. And it's called fake, that's why I call it fake, it fake uh, temperature sensor. Uh, it's a test double, so it means that it's only used in the tests and uh, is not suitable for production. But it's, um, and it's implementing the same interface, the same temperature interface, temperature sensor interface. And, but it's written by me uh, in, a, in, a, in a separate file, obviously. You don't, you don't see it here. And it's basically um, returning always 2,000 as a, uh, on the is dangerous method. Um, and then the rest of the test is pretty much the same. We have we instantiate our nuclear reactor, uh, we pass, we inject a sensor, and we do the same assertions as before. The difference here is one small. I would say that is uh, uh, much more, much less um, verbose in this case. It's uh, yeah more compact and uh, more understandable. It doesn't leak uh, implementation details. The second uh, version, obviously. And I can control easily these, uh, this fake temperature sensor and use it in different tests. I don't have to rewrite all this, this thing all the, all the times in, in different kind of uh, um, test cases. But the most important thing is that what if I change in my production code the name of this method, the change the current temperature, or I call it multiple times, maybe to verify and then I do an average, and then I, I will use that average to do my logic, or stuff like that. I change implementation details. This test is going to fail, because I'm expecting that this is called once, uh, that this has this precise name. And this test is not going to fail, because I only changed the implementation details and not the behavior of, uh, of my class. This is obviously a super simple example. Uh, so. It can get more complicated. You can have more dependencies. And you can use this technique, for example, or this technique, this fake uh, kind of test double uh, for repository instead of using the actual repository that, that talks to the database. So it gives us a bit more stable tests. But obviously, it's something that we need to uh, learn. It's a, it's a way of, of creating test double that we need to learn. Um, but yeah, it's not about metrics here. It's just a technique to improve the quality. But who is going to tell me uh, if the quality of, uh, of my tests is actually increasing or decreasing? There is another technique that has tools to support it, which is called mutation testing. So whoever who here has ever heard about mutation testing? OK, a few, not bad. And uh, who has ever used mutation testing in a, a production project? Other than nice, OK. Um, it's less, usually, when I give this talk. It's less people so, uh, raise their hands, so it's uh, not bad. And uh, it's very simple. It's a very simple technique that answers basically this question. If you make a change that alters the behavior or the meaning of your code, so not the implementation, 
do you have a test that fails and then tells you, hey, you changed something meaningful there, so um, fix the test or fix the code if you did it wrong. Um, then obviously you need a tool for that because the technique, this technique um, includes creating a mutant that is actually changing your production code programmatically uh, and then running all the tests. And if you have a test that fails, then the, that mutant is killed. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, mus the, the mutant escaped your test suite. And uh, you want to kill mutants, so that's why it's green. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. And let's see what a mutant is. Um, we have our, uh, our simpler version of our nuclear reactor. And uh, we already saw this mutant. It's, it's basically what we did when we were kind of drunk uh, after lunch. And it's changing the greater or equal than to gra just greater than. That is a change in behavior. And we saw it because our nuclear reactor exploded. So it's clearly a bug, a change in behavior at least. Um, but let me show you a bit more with live coding. Actually, I don't want to do that because it's risky. Uh, it's always risky, so I, I almost never do that. But I can show you the output of Infection. Infection is a tool uh, in PHP for mutation testing. Uh, it's easy to install, so it's like uh, by the end of the talk, you can install it and, uh, and, uh, and try it yourself. But uh, the most important thing here is that running Infection on this test suite plus this piece of code with two lines of code, Infection was able to uh, create five mutations, five mutants of our code. Like, do you remember? Two lines of code. And then it was able to find five different versions. And we killed four with our test, except one. And this is the, M, the red M. And the one that it wasn't killed is this one. You can see the diff here, probably. But it's, uh, yeah, it's the move from the change from uh, greater or equal than to greater than. Um, so it's telling us, you miss a test there. Uh, because if, that's, if that logic is correct, then you miss a test. And what we can do, there's many ways, many better ways to, to fix this test. But one of the ways is like writing just a line and testing the, uh, the boundary of your, uh, of your method. Again, there's better ways, but just for the sake of, of uh, simplicity, uh, we can keep it like this. With this, we have 100% also mutation score, not only 100% of code coverage. Uh, so the pros are, well, it's easy to set up. At least infection is uh, relatively easy to, to set up on a very simple uh, initial configuration, then it can get complicated. Might spot potential critical bugs, as we saw. Uh, might protect you from possible bugs. Uh, improves your testing skills because if you always see, if you see that uh, there's a particular mutant uh, always escape, then it means that you need to change the way you you write your unit test, so it can improve your skills even. The cons is that they can match different tools results. It works with PHP unit, with PHP spec even, uh, but you cannot match different tools if you're using different tools in in the same test suite. Uh, or, in, or for, to test the same software. Um, that's a bit of a miss. Uh, some mutants are harmless. It's going to produce a lot of mutants, and some of them are just harmless, so you just leave it there. You don't want 100% mutation score. Uh, and it's way slower, obviously, because it needs to run. Uh, it obviously works on cache, on uh, uh, predicting which tests are uh, relevant, but it's still slower. It's slow also because uh, worse uh, code quality uh, means longer mutation tests. So uh, if you have um, a, a slow mutation uh, run, it m might also mean that uh, you need to improve the, the, the code quality. But code quality and testing are very related, obviously. Um, how you can use it? Well, you can, uh, like we did it right now, on all your test suite. If it's small enough and it's fast enough, you can use on uh, all your test suite even putting an, uh, a minimum uh, mutation score in the pipeline. So you never go below that score. You never decrease the quality of your test, at least. And also while developing a new feature on a smaller scope. Uh, for example, you're developing, a, you're extending your software in a way, so you're, you can run it in your uh, smaller scope uh, on your, a bunch of files that you're touching and a bunch of tests that you're uh, writing for those files. 
and in that way, if your overall test suite is too slow, you can still use it in, your, uh, in, a, in a smaller scope. Um, yeah, shared code is satisfied with mutation score and everything, but okay, now I have the tools, but the tools are, are never the final answer in the end. Um, the practice, most of the time, is going to save you, is going to help you increasing the confidence in your test suite. And uh, one of the practices is a release code frequently. So release to production constantly and frequently um, to, the, to the end user. Monitor, obviously, what you, what you ship. Take risks is, is important. And uh, having confidence in your test suite helps you in taking risks, and taking risks helps you in, uh, uh, in increasing the confidence in your test suite. So it's a very good cycle. Uh, educated risk, possibly, and learn from fa failure, always. If there's a failure, then it's a missing test, then write that missing test, or write a better test. Uh, in one word is ship it. Um, and with this, I say dziękuję, or thank you for listening. <laughs> And uh, there's a QR code for uh, uh, a form joined in to, to give feedback. It's very important for us speakers and the conference uh, if you give feedback. And uh, there's also all the other talks, obviously. So feel free to go there and, and give feedback. I think we have a few minutes for questions, right? So yes, I will uh, give you the cube. <laughs> oh, sorry. Too short. Hello, uh, I have two related questions. First one is, uh, there is a possibility to have 100% of MSI for uh, mutation tests. Yes, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily, you shouldn't be your end goal, but in, short, in the smaller systems, like the super small that we saw there, just the nuclear reactor, you can achieve it. But uh, for complicated systems, no, because there's a lot of, uh, uh, harmless mutants, as I mentioned, um, and you shouldn't like strive for around 100%. If you have a complex system, like 80% is already a lot. So it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite good. It's possible. It's not useful, in my opinion, in complex system. In easy, in simpler systems, yes. Okay, you have answered my second question. What? Sorry. You have answered my second question. Was about the ah. optimum MSI index. Ah, okay, yes. I think, um, yeah, in my experience, even 70, 80 uh, on a maybe complex system with legacy code is, is, uh, is, is okay, it's more than okay, yeah. But yeah, it's, it depends a lot of, you know, a lot of things, so. <laughs> Other questions? Or just if you want to hold uh, the cube, it's nice, <laughs> it's fun. No? Okay. And uh, well, thanks again, and uh, remember the feedback. Thanks for listening.